Hey there, welcome to this week's episode of Strong and Sculpted, the podcast by me, Kim Constable, aka The Sculpted Vegan, about all things strong and all things sculpted. And this week we are going to talk about not only how to get stronger, but definitely how to get more sculpted because it's all about how to ask for a spot in the gym. Asking for a spot is so important because it's the only way that you can build bigger muscles because it enables you to go to failure and training to failure, training past the point at which your muscles can lift the weight is actually what causes the muscles to grow and causes you to get exceptional results. This was a training that we did inside of my private members area and I have loved bringing these trainings to you because they are so, so valuable and I hope that you are also enjoying listening to them. And before we get into the training, I just want to ask you, if you haven't already, to remember to leave a review on iTunes because we are just about to make the draw to give away one program to one lucky reviewer this month. Every single month, we give away a free program. It can be any program at all in our entire suite of programs to someone who has left a review. So if you haven't left a review this month, make sure you hop into iTunes and do that now and you could be the lucky winner. So I'm going to dive into this episode now. Enjoy and I will speak to you after. Let's get started. Let's get started. Uh, Okay, so today's training is all about how to ask for a spot in the gym. And this is something that I have found is extremely necessary if you want to make good progress in the gym, but it is something that women especially have a lot of problems with. Now, have you ever noticed that guys, whenever you go to the gym, the the guys are always, not always, but a lot of the times they're training together. Whenever guys go to the gym, they don't just go by themselves, they go with another guy. And it's not because they have some kind of bromance going on. Usually it's because guys understand that in order to bang out some extra reps in the gym, they need someone with them to give them a spot. So because guys are usually gym buddies, because that's what guys do, you know, they go and they train together in the gym. Whenever guys are gym buddies, they go to the gym together, they spot each other, and that's why they get bigger muscle and that's why they get bigger gains. But what women normally do is they don't go to the gym for gains, they go to the gym for maintenance and to do body pump classes and to do loads of cardio and to kind of wander around looking at the machines and doing a couple of lap pull downs and hoping it's going to do something to some muscle in their body. So they never think to take a training partner with them because their goal isn't to get as big as possible. But the reason why women don't end up making good progress in the gym is because they don't have a partner. So that's just one thing to think about before we get started is that, you know, guys want to go to the gym and they want to get bigger. That's their sole aim. Let's get a bigger chest. Let's get bigger legs. Well, actually, most guys don't want to have bigger legs. It's like they're all top heavy. They all want to have big chests and big shoulders and, you know, and, and, and tight abs, but like nobody actually wants to build legs. And I always, whenever I look at a guy, I always want to know, does he have a good pair of legs? Because a good pair of legs shows that he's willing to work hard. If he doesn't have a good pair of legs, he's not willing to work hard. And well, not that he's not willing to work hard, but he hasn't worked hard enough. So I'm always looking at guys' legs. Okay. So let's get back to um, how to ask for a spot in the gym. First of all, let's discuss why is it even important to ask for a spot in the gym? So let me tell you a story. Whenever I first started training with Mark Getty, I went over to meet with him, first of all, and he was as wide as he was tall. And I was like, oh my God, this guy knows a massive amount about building muscle. Like most of you have heard the story about how I started training with my current trainer, Mark, which was, you know, I was after my first, uh, I did my first bikini competition last year in 2018. I didn't do my first one. I did my first one of the year. And I did um, two, I did two shows and I got a second and a third in huge classes of, I think there was like 30, um, 30 or 40 in each class. So really good result. And But I just didn't have the legs and the glutes that I wanted to have. It was more, well, not, not even the glutes so much. I just didn't have big legs. And I really wanted to have big muscular quads. And I, I felt really stuck because I had literally worked my ass off, like worked my ass off for the last two years trying to build bigger, bigger legs and trying to build bigger glutes. And they just weren't developing in the same way that my upper body was developing. So I thought, well, like, what can I do? I've been training by myself for a year. I had been training previously with my other prep coach, Curtis. And Curtis had prepped me uh, as in like he had designed my diet and training for my, um, for my show that I came for my two shows that I came second and third in, but he hadn't trained me throughout the year. 
So whenever I made a goal, I always had a goal. Once I come out of a show, I always had a goal. I'm always looking forward to the next show. I'm always saying like, what's my goal? What's my goal? I have a goal in life for everything. I have business goals. I have personal goals. That's why I like doing a shred. You know, it keeps me focused. I, goals keep me really, really focused. So whenever I finished Miami Pro, I, I just knew that I had to change something. I knew that I wanted bigger legs. I'd been inspired by my friend, Emma, who had the most incredible quads. And I said to her, you know, who do you train with? And she said, Mark Getty. And I said, right, take me to your leader. I need to meet this guy. He obviously knows a lot about building legs. And she was like, Mark Getty, Kim, Mark Getty. Like, seriously, this guy knows how to build muscle. So she took me to meet Mark and I looked at him and Mark's bicep is 24 inches in, inches in circumference. His bicep is as big as my waist. Actually, my waist is not 24. I wish my waist was 24. My waist is about probably 26 seven or 28 inches maybe I don't know I haven't haven't actually measured my waist in a long time but um anyway so he but so I looked at this guy and I was like he knows a shitload about building muscle okay you don't get to be one of the biggest bodybuilders in the world and not know how to build muscle it's like you know if you were to go to you know Richard Branson for business advice like you're gonna trust what he says because you're gonna go well this guy knows how to make millions so I'm not gonna question what he says I'm just gonna do exactly as he tells me and hopefully I will make millions too so I went to Mark Getty and I said he said well you know what do you want and I said I want you know bigger legs um he said no problem he said like are you are you willing to work hard and I was like Mark I'm a trooper like I am the hardest worker you know and he was like good woman he said be in here Monday morning so I said great so I arrived in Monday morning and I rocked up and he said, we're going to train legs. And I said, great, love training legs. And he kind of raised his eyebrow at me. and was like, okay. And, uh, and I was like, yes, yeah. so I trotted off behind it. That was great. We did, you know, some leg extensions and that was fine. And the leg extension we went really heavy on the final set, but I was like, no, no, I have good strong quads. So I was you know, happy with the leg extensions. So then he br- brings me over to, um, he says, we're going to do some squats. So he brings me over to the Smith machine and I was like, Smith machine like you know I was one of these evangelical squatters at the time if you're going to squat you must squat with a free bar because it uses all of the extra muscles like the supporting muscles in the body and it's really good for functional fitness because this is what I had heard right this is what all my training had taught me this is what all the books I read taught me this is what I, you know all of the trainers teach they're like if you're going to squat you should squat in a free bar and mark the biggest bodybuilder I'd ever met with absolutely enormous legs leads me over to the Smith machine. So I was like, oh, we're squatting on the Smith. And he was like, yep. No, I, I didn't say anything. Normally I'm quite vocal and I would have been like, oh, really? Do you think that's a good idea? Questions about that. I was like, zip, zip it up, Kim. I was not questioning anything. I was literally going to do everything this guy told me to do. So Mark puts me on and he goes, right, 10 reps. And um, so I did 10 reps just with the bar. And I'm like, oh, Lord, yeah, I have to get the form correct. I have to show him how amazing I am and what a great squatter I am. And I was like, you know, had all my pride and all my, you know, world audience was coming in. So anyway, um, we did a set, you know, of 10 with the bar. So then Mark, Mark waxed two 10 plates on, right? Now it's a really heavy bar. The bar on his squat, it's a, it's a straight Smith squat, a straight Smith um, bar, and it's 30 kilos, right? The bar plus the catches is 30 kilos. So he throws on two 10s. So we're doing 50 kilos. And I'm like, okay, it's great. 50 kilos, easy enough, like first set. So I, you know, get underneath and did 10 reps. Perfect. So then he picks up two more 10s, boom, boom, bangs two more 10s on the other side. So I'm like, okay, 70 kilos, great. So, you know, so I get under the bar and, you know, squatted out 10 reps, really began to kind of struggle. Now, Mark's standing behind me, right, with his fingers underneath the bar, using his biceps to spot me if I need it. So he has his hands on the bar the whole time. The bar's going down and up, down and up, down and up. Now, he's not actually touching the bar. He just has his fingers on it, feeling the momentum the whole time. 70 kilos. So I go, yeah, I'm pretty strong. You know, 70 kilos is fine for me. So I get underneath the bar, squatted down 10 reps. But by the end of the 10 reps, I really was beginning to struggle, but I still managed to lift it. Like he didn't need to spot me or touch the bar. I still managed to lift it. But I was like, Fuck, that was hard. Okay, that was hard. And I was like, I'm probably going to do another set. Like, I wonder what he's going to put on. So Mark picks up two 10s. Oh, he's chatting away to me. Yeah. Picks up two more 10s. Boom, boom, wax them on. So now we're up to 90 kilos. And I'm like, holy shit, 90 kilo Smith squat. Like a 90 kilo Smith squat is pretty heavy because you don't have that rock. You know, you can't, you're locked in. In a Smith squat, what I have learned is like, screw all this functional fitness crap. Whenever, if you want to build big legs, you squat on the Smith. Do you know why? Because it locks it into your legs. Like I, you know, bodybuilders are not interested in, you know, functional fitness or, you know, like powerlifters are moving the most weight. Bodybuilders are interested in aesthetics. 
squatting on the Smith machine builds big legs because it locks it into your legs and it's a much safer way to squat. So it depends on what your goal is. So anyway, so 90 kilos. So I'm like, oh, okay, no problem. So I like, so I, um, so I, I get underneath the bar, right? Un- unrack the bar thinking, right, this is quite heavy. So I'm like, okay, okay. So I psych myself up, boom, knock down and push it back up. I was like, oh shit, that was heavy. So Mark, so Mark keeps his hands on the bar. Come on, keep going. Easy for you. So I'm down for another rep, boom, down for another rep, three. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is like, this is like torture by three reps. I was like, oh, 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 beginning to hyperventilate. I was like, no, I will not let this beat me. Four reps, boom, five reps. By this stage on five reps, I'm like, and I'm like, you know, we're starting to struggle halfway up. And then Mark starts just to give me a little lift with his fingers. So then I'm like, okay. So I'm like, okay, six reps down. So uh, he gave me this a little lift at the bottom and then just a little lift all the way up to the top for six. He goes, come on, come on, keep going. There's more there. And I'm thinking, there's more there. I'm done. I can't even get from bottom to top. Okay. Psyched it up, dropped seven. And he goes, come on, lift it up. You give me just a little lift. Okay, come on, go again, go again. It. And by this point, I'm thinking, oh my God, like, I'm like, what is going on here? You know, I had never, ever pushed this far past failure. You know, like once I really started to struggle and it took me a long time, not a long time, but a couple of seconds to get from the bottom to the top, I would have racked it. By eight reps, it probably took me three seconds to get from the bottom to the top. There's no way I would ever have gone for the ninth or 10th rep, ever. And Mark was like, come on, there's more there. Come on, come on, this is light for you. That's what he said, light for you. This is lightweight, light for you. I was like, it's not light for me. I didn't say it at the time, but I was thinking it. So I went down for the ninth rep, right? Boom, hit the bottom, started to struggle. There's no way I could have got from the bottom to the top without Mark. Now he wasn't lifting the bar and hoisting it up. As Mark says, he was spotting me with his biceps, right? As someone's spotting you with their biceps, you are still taking most of the weight. So I lowered down with control. Mark lifts me up and he gives me just a little push, but he makes me work for it. Like I'm pushing, 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 pushing. Maybe it takes me six seconds from bottom to top. Mark goes, come on, one more. And I was like, no, Mark, no, Mark, one more. And I was like, oh, shit. So I bum, knocked it down. And then Mark made me work for that last rep. And I was like, one, two, three, four. Like, I swear, it must have taken me eight seconds to go from the bottom to the top. I went halfway up. I was thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And then my mind went, yes, you can. And I bum, I locked it in. And I just kept pushing, knowing that Mark was there to spot me, knowing that I was never going to fall. I was never going to hurt myself. Nothing was ever going to happen. I was going to collapse under this bar. Mark was there to spot me, pushed all the way from bottom to top, boom, racked the bar. I swear, I had never experienced anything like that in my entire life. That final set was heavier than I ever would have done by myself. The whole set was heavier than I ever would have done by myself. And those last four reps that I ground out between six and 10 were insanely hard reps. I never, ever could have performed those reps by myself. So then we move on to the incline hack squat and we repeat the same process again. You know, first set, oh, it's okay. My legs are killing me by this point. First set's all right. Second set's harder, like quite a lot harder. Third set, Mark, literally, it's leave your soul on the floor set, right? Same thing again. Got the first maybe four reps in and then Mark starts to spot me. He goes, come on, come on, there's more there. So Mark's holding onto the bar and he's feeling the momentum of the bar as I'm going, not lifting it, but just if he feels me getting stuck, he's just giving a little bit of a lift to keep the momentum going. So I managed to grind out six reps and Mark said, come on, come on, come on, four more, four more. He said, he always says two more, two more. So I said, oh my God, oh my God. Seven, did it. Eighth rep. On the ninth rep, I was thinking, I can't, I can't, I can't. He was like, you can, two more. So did the ninth rep and it was a, like a push and a slow, slow, slow push all the way to the top. And then 10th rep, I was like, oh my God, I can't, I can't. In my mind, like I'm, I'm dying, right? I'm screaming in my mind, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then the other part of my mind goes, shut up and do it. So I'm like, boom, down, metal to metal. And then it was like, Mark was like, come on. So I'm pushing and he's giving me a wee lift when I stick. And I'm pushing, he's giving me a wee lift when I stick. I'm pushing, he's giving me a wee lift when I stick. So he's not like pulling it all the way up. He's making me do the effort until I stick. Then he's getting me going again. Then I stick. Then he's getting me going again. Took me eight seconds from bottom to top. Boom, we racked the bar. So that was how our first leg session went down. And I literally hobbled out of that gym. Now, let me tell you what happened. 
I woke up the next morning and I swear to God, I felt I had been hit by a truck. I have never experienced pain in my legs like that first training session. My mother-in-law was staying, my my parents-in-law were staying here from Australia and I had to walk backwards down the stairs. I'm not kidding. Backwards down the stairs. I couldn't go frontwards. I used to stand at the top of the stairs and stare all the way down the stairs and think, and like psych myself up and think, okay, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Come on, Kim. And then take one step. And, like, ha, ha. and I got, and I was like hanging over the banister trying to take the weight off my legs because the pain in my quads was so bad. I had to stand and contemplate whether it was worth getting out of the car or not. If I dropped something on the ground, I would look at it and think, how important is that thing to me that I've just dropped? Because I don't know whether if I get down there, I'm going to be able to get back up. My legs were sore for 10 days after training. Honestly, by by the seventh day after that leg workout with Mark, I honestly was still in so much pain. I, I said to my husband, I think I've damaged something in my legs. And he laughed and he was like, you haven't? I said, no, Ryan, I really think that I have damaged muscle fibers in my legs. I, this can't be right. I can't still be sore after seven days. But of course, the pain did go away and we repeated the process again the next week. And I never, ever went through, I was so terrified I would go through that pain again, but I never, ever did. I never went through that pain ever again. And Mark will always say, you'll only go through that pain once. Once you go through that pain, yes, it will be sore, like I train legs today. And I know my legs are going to be sore tomorrow because we pushed really hard today. But you'll never go through that intense pain ever again once you've gone through it once. So why is it important, right? Why is it important to have a spotter and to, and to train this way? Well, it's because m- a lot of people don't know that muscle only grows in the final sets, in the final reps of the final set. My muscle didn't start growing until I reached probably the fifth to sixth rep of the final set of those Smith squats and the final set of the incline hack squat. Why is this? Because up until that point, my body was capable of moving the load. My muscles were strong enough to lift the weight. Even though I was struggling, struggling doesn't mean that they're not strong enough. Struggling just means that you have to push a little bit harder to lift them. So whenever I was able to push from the bottom to the top in that sixth rep, yes, it took me three to four seconds to get up but I was still capable of doing it. So it's kind of like, do you ever hear about these women who suddenly like their child gets trapped under a car or something happens or their dog like falls in a river and they're like, and they're able to like lift rocks or lift cars. Like they get a massive burst of adrenaline, which like, you know, fuels the muscles in order to make them, you know, your fight or flight goes off. You get a massive boost of adrenaline and then you can like lift a car. Well, you know, that's kind of what happens. You know, you, your body, whenever you're training this intensely, gets a huge shot of adrenaline, which means that you, you know, you, especially if you get your brain in the game and get yourself psyched up, which means that you can lift really big weights. But until you reach the point of failure, you haven't grown any muscle fibers because your muscle was, has lifted what it was capable of lifting. So I always use the analogy of an iron bar. I say, how, how do you know how strong an iron bar is? Well, you only know how strong an iron bar is when it breaks. If you load 100 kilos onto an iron bar and the iron bar holds the 100 kilos, then you know it is capable of holding 100 kilos. If you load 110 kilos on and the bar bends and bends and bends and bends and eventually breaks, then you know that the bar is not capable of holding 110 kilos. So similarly, if you put 90 kilos on a a Smith machine and you squat it for four reps, you know that your muscles are strong enough to squat 90 kilos for four reps. Was it uncomfortable? Yes, damn right it was. Do you think it's do you think it's comfortable for the bar to hold like 100 kilos? Like, fair enough, it's an iron bar, it doesn't have feelings. But you know what I mean? Like, is it uncomfortable to push to those big heavy weights, to push to the, the very edge of your limits? Yes, of course it is. It's uncomfortable. It's never going to be because you're pushing your body to near maximal capacity, okay? But where the body actually builds muscle is when you push past maximal capacity. And that's when a spotter is very, very useful, or that is when you can utilize a spotter in order to grow more muscle, especially when you're training legs. Now, if you're training a smaller muscle group like shoulders or like triceps or biceps, it's, you know, I would get, Mark would spot me on a machine whenever I'm doing, you know, incline, um, 
uh, preacher curls. So I'm doing bicep curls and he's like helping me just, you know, push the weights because it's on a machine. But you can't really spot someone, you know, on dumbbells and you can't really spot someone, you know, on a, you, you can on an overhead cable, you can give the cable a push or a pull, but it's harder to spot on single muscle groups. And single muscle groups don't need as much of um, a stimulus in order to make them grow as a big muscle group like legs does. People just don't train legs hard enough. Okay. They don't train legs hard enough. They let your legs take up half your body. Training legs, it means that you're training half of your body. You're not like training triceps, you're training one small muscle group. Training shoulders, you're training three muscles. Fair enough. You know, you've got your your um your front shoulder, your middle shoulder, and your back shoulder. So you you know you are training three muscle groups, but it's still a small muscle group. But with legs, you're training half your body, and people just don't train hard enough. And if you want your legs to grow, or you want your muscles to grow in your body, especially the big compound movements, you know the the um, T bar rows and the lat pull downs, or you know, the, the back exercises, any kind of leg exercises, hamstring, glute exercises. If you can push past failure and you can enlist a spotter to help you do that, you will build more muscle. Another really good thing that a spotter does is give you, help you to get a full range of motion. So why is this important? Well, actually, I, I, I have a really good um, story about this today. And it was, I was training with Mark today and we have been, because I've been on slightly lower calories, I'm only on 1500 calories a minute because I'm on a shred. We haven't been pushing for personal bests. I only push for personal bests whenever I have a lot of food and I'm an off season and I'm, you know, and I'm eating a lot and I'm really focusing on building muscle. That's when I push my weights up and I go for big PBs. So at the minute I'm not doing that, but we are still pushing very, very heavy. But what we've been doing is rather than adding and piling on more and more and more weight, we have been working on getting full range of motion. Now I have a very good full range of motion in every single exercise. It's the yoga teacher in me. I just cannot do an exercise if I'm not going to perform it correctly. So, but if you don't have full range of motion, you are missing out on massive muscle building opportunities. And if you don't have a spotter to help you with full range of motion, fear can kick in and stop you from getting full range of motion. So I'll tell you what happened today. We were um, spotting, or sorry, we were squatting in the gym. We were doing a V squat, okay? So a V squat is where there's a platform that you put your feet on, which is angled, okay? So you face in with, so your toes are up in the air whenever, so the, the, the angle of the platform slopes down towards your feet. And so whenever you stand on it, your toes are pointing up and your heels are down. Then you put these two bars on top of your shoulder. So they're fixed bars and they come back almost like an H shape and you hold onto two handles and you load the weights on either side. So in this exercise, you the, the purpose is to step your feet slightly forward. So when you squat all the way down, your, your ass is nearly touching your heels. So you literally squat as far as you can possibly squat before pushing back up again. Now, I always do get really, really deep range of motion in this, but I don't ever go all the way, way, way down so that I am literally, uh, again, I can do a full yogic squat, you know, because I'm like a yogi, so I can get down into full malasana squat. And so uh, whenever, but I never go right, right down into a full squat because, you know, it, I usually have like a serious amount of weight on the bar, maybe 160, 180 kilos on the bar. So there's always that fear in your mind. Like, I go, don't get me wrong. I go to like nearly, I'm not selling myself short here. I go to like an inch above where my full range of motion is. But today I said to Mark, you know what? I'm going to go ass to the freaking grass. Uh, and he said, go for it. Let's do it. Let's get the full stretch and the full squeeze. So I got on that machine. We had 100, um, I think, 60 kilos on for my final set, 20, 40, 60, 20, 60, 120 plus another 10 is 140 plus 160 kilos top set, right? My top set in that machine would be about 180 kilos. So we had 160 on. So I loaded up the bar, squatted all the way down, boom, ass to the grass and pushed all the way back up again. One. Then I squatted all the way down, boom, ass to the grass, pushed all the way back up again. So I, you know, I did that for, I think, six reps and Mark was like, come on, come on, two more, two more. So we did two more. And he's like, come on, come on, two more. You got this, two more. So I did two more and I did 10 reps. And I stood off. I was like, yes, I'm so deep. I'm so happy with those. And, you know, he was spotting me in the final, final reps. And he said to me, but he said here, and I said, I went so deep, like literally ass to the grass. And he said, but the thing about it is, Kim, he said, you have really, really, really strong glutes. He said, whenever you 
squat down to the bottom, he said, I don't even have to lift you at the bottom. He said, you go all the way down. He said, and you push all the way up. He said, where you catch in your final set, in your final reps is whenever you hit the halfway point and the quads take over. And I was like, oh my God. I said, I'm going to talk about that in one of my trainings because that is so such a good point and it's so important. Because one of the reasons why people get sore backs whenever they squat is because their glutes aren't strong. Whenever your glutes aren't strong, your lower back picks up the slack. It picks up the work that the glutes should be doing. So whenever a lot of people squat and they only go halfway down, it's because they're, not, they're they don't have strong glutes. They have stronger quads and they have stronger glutes. Now I have very strong quads, but I have exceptionally strong glutes because I've spent the last three years trying to make them bigger, so they're exceptionally strong. So whenever I squat all the way down and I go ass to the grass and I, I can push back up, I can have 200 kilos on my shoulders and I push back up. Where I get stuck is when I hit halfway and my quads take over. So having that spotter there just to, you know, Mark, Mark feels that bar. He feels when it gets stuck and he just gives me a little, mm, and it's not like he doesn't take it over and like lift it all the way from bottom to top. He waits until he feels me you know, stagnate a little bit. And then he just gives it a little push just to get me going again. And then I take the rest of the weight and push it all the way up. He doesn't lift it from my, I stick to the top. He just gives me a little push, right? The little push then gets me from bottom to top. But I thought that was such an important point because I see this all the time in the gym, right? I see it all the time in Mark's gym. There's a PT who trains there, really nice guy, but he he is the he trains people with the worst form I've ever seen. So I would do my top weight, my top, top, top personal best ever with the strength that I have. Mark says I'm one of the strongest people he's ever trained, one of the strongest females he's ever trained, is um, my top weight on the incline hack squat is 190 kilos, okay? And that's with a spotter. So one of the PTs the other day, he had this girl on the, um, on the incline hack squat and I glanced over and I was like, oh my God, like she had so many plates on it. And I, and I was like, what weight is that girl squatting? And Mark was like, don't even look, don't even look. And I was like, she has 240 kilos on there. And he was like, don't even look, don't even look. So the guy, so the guy squatting, I was like, come on, come on, you ready? Come on. So this is a bad spot. This is, this is what not to do. So he's like, come on, come on. So he like, she unhooks it and she goes, okay. She goes, and she lowers six inches and then pushes back up. Her knees barely bent, okay? Now, this is a machine that has maybe three feet of, of expanse, okay? To go all the way down and all the way back up. Maybe not even three feet, maybe two and a half feet. But it's like, boom, all the way down. And she goes six inches down that pushes back up. I watched them do 10 reps and she barely bent her knees. It was like, urgh, urgh. And I was, and I was, I was like, I can do that with 400 kilos. Like what part of her body was she actually working in that exercise? And this is where people fail, okay? This is where they fail, even if they have a spotter or they don't. They don't go for full range of motion. So if you have a spotter and you have a good spotter, you can you can get that full range of motion and you can really stretch the muscle and then squeeze it at the top. And that's what so many people miss. They miss the stretch and the squeeze. I always say to people, whenever they're training, they say, is it okay to lose a bit of form in the final reps? Is it okay to do this? I always say, as long as you get the full stretch and the full squeeze, then you're growing muscle if you go to failure. So whenever you are on, say, um, say you're doing a squat, right? You're on that V squat. Whenever I squatted my ass right to the grass, my full gluteus maximus area was completely stretched out. And then as I contracted it, once you get right to the bottom of the squat, what happens is rather than you stagnating and your quads taking all of the, the weight, if you only go halfway, you, you activate the kinetic chain the whole way up, right? So you, once you squat your ass to the grass, if, if you, so here's what happens, okay? It's hard to explain, but if, here's what happens if you only squat halfway. I see a lot of people only squatting and they go down halfway. They don't go below parallel, right? They don't bring their ass below their knees, down to the ground. They only go to parallel and then they push back up. If you drop down and then catch it halfway, it all goes into your lower back. Your lower back catches the weight your, it all goes into your lower back and you and you hurt your lower back because you squat and you and, and then your lower back catches it and your quads catch it and you push all the way back up okay so your lower back is taking all that weight especially if you have a big weight in the bar now if you squat all the way down to the bottom which you will feel more confident doing if you have a sp if you have a spotter if you squat all the way down to the bottom and then push back up 
it activates your entire body from the feet up. It activates the muscles in the feet, then the ankles, then the shins, then the calves, then the, the lower quad, the middle quad, the upper quad, the hamstring, the glute, the lower back, the middle back, the upper back, the shoulders. It's like a kinetic chain and it activates it all the way up. So it goes dun 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 dun, dun boom, and then you you come all the way up to the top of the squat. So you're not hurting your lower back because you're not catching it halfway and you're getting the full stretch in every single muscle on the way down and the full squeeze at the top. And that is why a spotter is essential because it gives you the confidence to go and get that full stretch and that full squeeze and that full range of motion. And if you combine the full stretch, the full squeeze, the full range of motion with training to failure and getting those final failure reps, those final final forced reps, you will grow incredible amounts of muscle, incredible amounts of muscle. So how do you ask for a spot in the gym? Okay, so hopefully I have now like sold you on why it's important to ask for a spot in the gym. Um, but how do you ask for a spot in the gym? Well, a lot of people, especially women, whenever they first start training, they get, you know, worried about asking for a spot because, you know, you're just finding your way around the gym and you're not really sure of your place in the gym yet. And it kind of still is like, you know, the man's area where all the free weights are. So what I would say first is, you know, just allow yourself to get comfortable in the gym first. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Don't go into the gym for the first time and be like, okay, I need to ask for a spot, I need to ask for a spot. Like get in there and get comfortable with the weights. Get comfortable first with, you know, with what is the squat rack and how do you use it? You know, what is a bench press and how do you use it? You know, how do I set up the Smith machine? Where's the best place to put the bench? You know, you're whenever you ask someone for a spot, you don't want them to be, you're not asking them for advice and you're not asking them for guidance. You're not asking them to train you. You're just asking them to help help you bang out the final few reps so the muscles will grow. You want to be very clear in your mind about what it is that you want, because especially if you're a woman who looks like she's just started training, the guys will always want to give you advice. The guys never want to give me advice in the gym anymore, let me tell you, because I look like I train, you know, I look like I'm buff. So if I say to them, listen, could you give me a spot? You know, I, and I say to them, I think I'll get eight reps by myself, but I want 10 or I think I'll get six. I might struggle in the final four. That's when I'll need you. They don't say, oh, you're not doing that right. Or you should consider doing this. Or why are you, you know, doing your bench press on the Smith machine? They don't have any advice for me. They just say, no problem at all, love, I'll spot you. So you want to be very clear in your mind first about what it is that you, you know, that you're doing in the gym. You want to be comfortable with the exercises. You want to be comfortable with, you know, moving around the gym and that you, you know, you know what you should be doing and you've got your form correct and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But then at some point, whenever you feel comfortable in the gym, it's time to ask for a spot. So how do you do it? Well, this is just my personal way that I have learned to ask for a spot. So the first thing that I will do is I will, I will scoop out the gym, right? So I'll look around and I'll think, okay, what guys are here, what girls are here, who looks like they would be capable of giving me a spot? Who looks like they train? You want to ask the person who looks like they train, the guy who has muscle, the guy who has his headphones on and his cap on, and he looks like he's just there doing his thing. You want to ask the people who look like they have experience. Don't ask, you know, uh, you know, a, a 90 year old granny who's, you know, who's like curling her two pound dumbbells. You don't want to be asking her for a spot. Okay. She looks harmless, but she's probably not going to know what to do. So you want to ask someone who looks like they know what they're doing. So then what I do is I watch this person. So I, I, I usually pick this person out whenever I'm doing my first couple of sets because you only want to ask for their for their help in on the final set. You want to be respectful of these people's time. You don't want to be asking for, you know, for a spot on every single exercise, nor on every single set. You only want a spot on your final set. So you, you have time to scope this person out while you're doing your first two or three sets of the exercise. So I would quite often try and make eye contact, and maybe smile and be like, hi, yeah, and just, you know, smile or whatever, and just, you know, and, and, you know, make it known that I'm friendly or whatever. And, and then once you've made eye contact with them, and it's not even, you know, it's not even necessary to make eye contact with them. You can just, you know, waltz up and ask them. But you want to be, um, you know, I always try and make eye contact with them first, right? So then I wait until they have finished one of their sets. So you want to be respectful of what they are doing. And you want to wait until they are on a break in between their sets. That might mean that you have to go a little earlier than planned or wait a little longer than planned. But you wait until they have finished their set. Whenever they set down their weights from their set, then that's when you say to them, can I ask you, would you mind giving me a spot? Because you don't want your set to impinge on theirs. So you don't want, you know, you don't want them to have to rest for too long, which they will do if you wait too long to ask them. Like you don't want to ask them just as they're picking up their weights to do their, their final set. 
you want to, you know, ask them whenever they've just set down their weights. So I would say to them, you know, would you mind giving me a spot? Um, and more, I mean, I've never had anyone say no, never, never had anyone say no. Although recently, actually, my husband told me in the gym, there was, there's a girl, who, a woman who trains in the gym. Um, quite, and she's there all the time. And Ryan needed a spot on his bench press in his final set. And he said to her, would you mind giving me a spot on the final set here? And she was like, oh, no, no, no. I, I don't think I would feel, you know, confident. And he was like, oh, but it's okay. Like I should be able to like lift it. I just want to, you know, someone there to make sure, you know, to help me. She was like, no, no, honestly, I really wouldn't feel, I really wouldn't feel happy about it. And he was like, oh, okay, no problem at all. And I was like, really? She said, no. I was like, that's the first time I've ever, ever heard anyone say no um, to a spot. So that's the only time I've ever heard anyone say no in the gym. I'm sure it has happened, but I, 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 haven't, I haven't heard it. Especially if you ask a guy and you are, you know, and you're a female and you say to them, can you give me a spot? Quite often they'll be so happy to give you a spot. So you say, can you give me a spot in this set? Now, here's the next thing you have to do, okay? You have to tell them, how many reps you want and how many you think you will get. So if I'm doing a bench press, okay, I can do um, a 50 kilo bench press for, uh, which is about, how many pounds is that? 100 and, 100 and uh, there's 2.250, yeah, but 100, oh, just over 100 pounds, about 100 and, 102 or 105 pounds, 105 pounds, I think it is, um, bench press, okay? And I will do it easily by myself for six reps. I want to have someone there for the seventh and eighth rep just in case I start to fail. And on the eighth and, and on the ninth and tenth rep, I like to have someone there to help give me a lift. Now, I'm still doing most of the work, but the ninth and tenth, tenth rep for me on a 50 kilo bench press is where I will start to fail. And I actually haven't done a, a bench press in a long time. I might even be able to do heavier than that now, but a year ago, that's what I was benching whenever I did a free bar bench. So I will say to the person, I will put 50 kilos on and the guy, I'll say to the guy, do you mind giving me a spot? And they'll be like, sure, no problem at all. No problem at all. And they'll come over and they stand behind you. And then I say to them, I'll probably get six reps by myself. And this is where it's important for you to get comfortable in the gym first and kind of be comfortable with the weights because you don't want to be whacking 100 kilos on there and like you're bummed that like you can't even lift one rep. You know, you want to like show that you kind of know what you're doing. So I will say, I think I'll, I should be able to get six reps. I, I might need you to spot me on the final four, but don't lift the bar too much. So I will, you know, because what a lot of guys will do is, especially if they're not used to spotting, if once you start to struggle, they'll be like, and they just like lift it. And you're like, you know, you don't want them to lift it. You want them to keep the momentum going. And unfortunately, you can't really teach this. If they're not used to spotting, you're just going to have to suck it up and do whatever they, they do. But as long as you get the negative on the way down, you're still getting some extra work. So I, but I will always say to them, don't lift it too much. I want to struggle. Okay. So, but if you tell them you want to struggle, then they have that in their mind. So I'll say, I'll get six reps. I'll need you probably for the final four, but I want to struggle. Okay. And they'll be like, okay, great. So then you do the six reps and then they're, you know, they're spotting you. And also I'll also say to them, like my husband, when you spot him, he hates for you to keep your hands on the bar. He wants you to step in when he starts to fail. Whereas I detest stepping in when he starts to fail, because once he starts to fail, it's too late. I like to keep my hands on the bar, not lifting it, but just feeling the motion so that I can feel whenever he stagnates. So whenever he stagnates a little bit, whenever you know you have that little tiny point of failure where the muscle starts to fail, that's where I'll give it the tiniest little lift just to keep the momentum going, just to keep the lift going. So I'll say to them, I want you to make it, you know, I want to struggle. And they'll say, okay, no problem. And normally if you do those three things, you know, I should be able to get six reps. I want to get 10, but I want to struggle. They won't lift it too much, but they will be there. Like, come on, come on. And, and whenever you're working together, even if you don't know this person, they'll be like, come on, you can do it. Come on. That's it. That's it. Come on. You've got this. You've got this. Yes. Cause they're like projecting into you and they're imagining that they're lying there and they're pushing this big weight. And so they will give you. And then the final one, you're like, mm, you know, and then they lift it up and boom, you rack it. And then you say to them, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And they say, no problem at all. And sometimes they'll say, let me know if you want to spot again on your next set. If they say that, great. Cause then you can say to them here, do you mind giving me a spot again? But if they're like, yeah, no problem at all, and they walk away, then you know you might have to ask someone else for a spot if you're moving on to your next exercise. Or you might be able to say to them, if they look kind of friendly and they're smiling at you again or whatever, not in a sleazy way, but like in a camaraderie way, then you might be able to say, here, can you help me again on this machine? And they probably will come and help you. And then quite often when you go to a gym regularly, you get, you know, you have gym buddies. Like there's a guy who trains at, I go to David Lloyd gym in 
uh, quite close to my house. Sometimes I really hate it though, because it's such a, it's, it's what I call a middle-class cardio gym. They really don't have good bodybuilding equipment, but there's a guy who trains there and his name's Albert. And I love Albert. And Albert's in his seventies, former, body, former bodybuilder. Absolutely love him. The two of us like stand and chat and get on and whatever. And if Albert's in the gym when I'm there, I literally trail him right. Albert, come help me. And like Albert will spot me on everything. And that's only just because we've built up a friendship over the years. So whenever you start going to a gym regularly, you will build up a friendship with people and they will be more than willing to spot you. And it does become easier and easier and easier and the last um and, and sorry and then and then like asking for a spot really just becomes so simple the only time i've ever felt uh, like funny about asking for a spot and it was so ridiculous was um whenever i was training in dublin recently my my son was at a, a tournament and i was training legs and i was doing smith squats and i haven't done smith squats like literally for years now for certainly over a year and i had about 110 kilos on the bar and there was this massive big buff guy behind me right who was also quite good looking and so that i think that put me off he was, well he wasn't quite good looking he was really good looking and he was obviously a competitor and you know he obviously competed and he was buff and he was big and he was good looking and I really wanted to ask him for a spot and he was kind of watching me train and I was watching him train and he knew that I was a competitor and I was buff and I knew that he was a competitor and he was buff and so we kind of wanted to talk to each other but we didn't want to talk to each other and I was having all of these like oh all of these world audience issues and in the end I didn't even I didn't ask him for a spot and I, I struggled I, I think I only got like four reps at 110 kilos before I had to rack the bar but you know what if he had been there spotting me if I had just sucked it up and said would you mind giving me a spot? You know, but I was having all these like, oh, all these world audience issues. <gasps> what if I'm not strong enough? What if I can't lift enough? What if, you know, so ridiculous, so ridiculous. So asking for a spot on a, on a squat can be a little more intimidating because quite often when people spot you, especially in a free bar, they actually tuck themselves right in behind you. So when I spot someone on a squat, I will like stand right in behind them. So I'm spooning them from behind and I tuck my arms up underneath their arms, underneath their armpits to the front and I lower with them and then lift up with them. Whenever you spot someone like that, then you can feel the movement as if you're, spot, as if you're squatting with them and you can give them that little extra lift whenever you need it. So that can be a bit intimidating to have a guy that you don't know, like spooning you from behind whenever you're squatting. But actually, it's a really lovely experience. And if you if you do spot, you know, train with someone regularly, and you you get them to spot you regularly, it can be like you know, Curtis used to squat when I my previous trainer he used to spot me like that and it was like a, there was a real sense of camaraderie like there was a real sense of whenever Curtis is right in behind you you know and he's obviously conscious I'm a guy you know I'm spooning her but I was like Curtis like seriously we're friends like get in there and spot me so he would have got right in behind me hooked his arms under me you know got into spot and we would have squatted and it, there's something so comforting about having that big warm presence behind you and you really just feel like you can lift the world so if you can just get over yourself and you can find someone that you feel comfortable with and you can spot them like that, you really can't help them make massive, massive muscle gains. So just to finish, one of the things that I want to just say is that it's important to remember that a spotter is there to make the work harder, not easier. Many people get confused. They think that a spotter should be there to make the work um, easier, but it's not. They're there to make the work harder. So the work only starts when the pain begins. That's not my quote. It's from a guy called Seth Godin, a marketeer. Um, I was listening to a book of his recently called The Dip. I was actually re-listening to it because I listened to it years ago. It's an amazing book. And he talked, I, I, I reference it quite a lot in, um, in my trainings because Seth talks about, you know, what, what we call the valley of despair. So he talks about, you know, you have this curve where, you know, people start something new and then they fall into the dip. And you either need to quit the dip and get out of it and like move on to something else, i.e. not another fitness program, but like moving. He talks about in marketing, you need to quit what you're doing. Like say the Sculpted Vegan wasn't working and I, and I moved sideways into yoga, which actually is what happened. Yoga wasn't working for me. I moved over into the Sculpted Vegan. I quit yoga in the dip because it was more profitable for me over here. That was a good quit. But he talks about, you know, most people quit in the dip and then they never actually achieve their goal. Um, and so... That's the, that's the thing about having um, about the work starting when the pain begins. So whenever you fall into the dip, right, 
that's when the pain begins. That's when the work starts. So whenever the pain begins in the, the sixth rep in the final set, that is where the work, that's when the work starts. You haven't even worked up until then. You've literally just used the muscles that you have. You haven't worked any new muscles. You haven't built any muscle. So the work only starts when the pain begins. And that's what a spotter is for. A spotter is there to help you with the work portion of your set. It's not, the spotter isn't there to take the weight for you or to make it easier. A, a spotter is there to make the work harder. So as long as you remember always that the work starts when the pain begins, which is usually around the sixth rep of the final set, then a spotter can be there to make the work harder and to help you reach failure. First, the three types of failure, if you'll remember from previous trainings, are failure on form. Once your, failure, once your form starts to go, that's the first set of failure. That's when most people stop, right? but they've missed the two other parts of failure, which are failure on the positive, which is where you need a spot to get from the bottom to the top in your squat rep, for example. And then you've got failure on the negative. Once you start you know, not being able to lower with as much control, then you truly have failed. So once a spotter needs to help you on the way down and on the way back up, that's when you've reached failure. And a bench press, once a spotter needs to help you lower the bar, you've truly reached failure. A lot of people, they just don't place, Dorian Yates always says that one of the biggest bodybuilders in the world, people just don't place enough importance on the on the negative part of the rep. They focus too much on the positive part. So they lower the bar. So, so they they once they can't push the bar up anymore, they forget that they can still lower it. And if you can still lower the bar, your muscle is still working. So if your muscle is still working, then you have the opportunity to still grow muscle. Once you can't lower it with control by yourself, then you've reached true, true failure. But many people never get to that point because they won't allow themselves to go there and they truly don't understand what failure means. So a spotter is there to make the work harder, to help you reach, to, to help you reach failure faster um, and more efficiently and to help you build more muscle. So that's what a spotter is for. Did you enjoy this training? Hopefully you did. I know that you guys wanted to get a lot out of it. And I, I know I talk more about why it's important to ask for a spot rather than um, how to actually ask for a spot. But I think that it's important to understand why, because sometimes understanding the why behind it can, can really push you out of your comfort zone and make you, you know, rather than just giving you strategies how to ask for a spot, if you truly know why it's important, you may find you may find the courage to actually ask for a spot. So you guys are laughing. Um, Josephine's saying, I'm sorry, big warm presence behind you. It's so true. Like, see if you have someone like I, I used to train with a friend of mine and she's like, the, she's just ickle. She's only five foot two. And I remember whenever we first went to train in the gym, um, she, she said, um, she said, oh, I've never, I, I don't lift any more than 40 kilos in a squat. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> 40 kilos in a squat. See the day that she thought she couldn't lift any more than 40 kilos. I had her lifting 80 kilos, 80 kilos squat because I was right behind her. I was like squatting with her. And even whenever she was squatting, she wasn't going low enough. And whenever she squatted down, I was pulling her down further. And she was like, oh my God, like I was pulling her right down so that, you know, six inches deeper than she would have gone herself and giving her that confidence and then helping her to keep the rep smooth and lifting it up. So whenever you have that, that presence behind you, that comforting presence behind you, it, it, it just gives you so much confidence and it just feels so, so good. Um, Julie's saying, is it okay to get a boyfriend this way? Well, it depends on the kind of guy you're asking for a spot, but yeah, I'm sure it probably is. Um, Lindsay's saying, how does someone spot you in back exercises? Well, it depends, Lindsay. Um, if you're doing a T-bar row, somebody can help you to, by you know helping you to lift up the um, the final few reps. It's it's harder to spot in back exercises. Quite often, if I'm doing a cable lap pull down, Mark will stand behind me with his hand on the cable, and I will do this with Ryan, my husband too, and just give just a little bit of a spot in those final few reps. You're pulling the cable just to give it. You know, as long as they're still controlling it on the negative on the way back up, you can pull the cable just to give them that final little spot. Same with like triceps, right? So sometimes I'm doing tricep push downs. Mark has his hand on the cable and he's just giving me that tiny little bit of an extra lift. So I'm still getting the negative. Same on the overheads as well. So it's harder to spot someone on back exercises, um, but you can on the cables because you can have your hand on the cables. You can't really spot someone on a seated row and um, on a on a, bar, a bent over barbell row. You can't really spot someone there either. But, you know, you can um, on some of the bigger back exercises, especially on T-bar rows, you can spot people, but it is harder on back exercises. It's, it's better to have a spotter for the bigger like leg exercises and things. Um, let me just see. Lorraine is saying, which exercises do we ask for a spot? Any exercise that you 
feel that you can't perform safely by yourself and go heavier. So a squat for sure. All kinds of squats for sure. Um, also, um, definitely on like, yeah, all I did, like leg press as well. You know, have someone, if you're doing a leg press, help have someone help push the leg, squat, leg press, hack squat, any leg exercises, even on a lying leg curl, right? On a lying leg curl, if you can, um, I wouldn't normally ask someone for a spot on the lying leg curl, but Mark always gives me a spot in my final few reps. You know, I can get half reps in, but he can just give me like a little lift just to get it all the way in. So I'm still getting on the negative. So you can do it on a lying leg curl. You can do it um, on a, a leg extension, okay? So Mark, quite often, if I'm lifting full stack, he will put his hand on the leg extension. He will just help just to pull it out, just to help me grind out another five or six reps. Um, like I said, T-bar row, you can ask for spots on shoulder exercises. So always good for any shoulder exercises, any military presses, someone standing behind you, military presses, obviously bench presses, any bench pressing machine or free bar or whatever spots get. So compound exercises that use a barbell or some kind of squatting machine are the ones where you, um, where you always, uh, well, you were always asked for a spot. Well, I hope you enjoyed hearing all of that just as much as I enjoyed teaching it. You can tell I get kind of passionate whenever I'm teaching and I feel like I'm really in the gym whenever I'm describing everything. So if you guys enjoyed this episode, please do leave me a comment and let me know what did you enjoy most about it? Are you going to go into the gym and ask for a spot now after hearing all this? Do you finally understand why it's important to go to failure and what you need to make that happen? Don't forget to leave me a comment on iTunes and you could be in with the chance of winning a free program in our monthly draw. So take care, enjoy the rest of your week and I will see you next time for another episode of Strong and Sculpted. Bye for now.